Thank you, Merlin, and thank you, Jurga, for invigorating start of this first day of the Congress. And thank you, Renato, for joining us this afternoon. We're excited to start this session and looking forward to engage you in conversation. Yes, hello, everybody. And uh, we are artists, Jasminas and myself, working together and developing research-based practice. Therefore, we will give you a short introduction and kind of provocation from the designer's point of view. Our interest in collective, collaborative, and organizational forms of art is contingent to the social and political transition that took place in Lithuania, in our home country, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Provoked by environmental disintegration, brought up by Chernobyl ecological disaster and the war in Afghanistan, our work ponders on ecological repair. In this brief provocation, we will skim through several artworks that seek allies with other species considering social, organizational, and consciousness-raising forms. Uh, the idea of commons and commonality between humans and modern humans was tested in a protest lab project uh, which started in 2005. There we experimented with the protest voice to resist privatization, expulsion and extinction of public and cultural sites in the city. Motivated to save the Ad House Cinema Theatre from demolition, we conceived series of artistic interventions probing artwork as device for plural ecology and collective action and as a vehicle to intervene in legislation. Here, the dog's bark brings together humans and non-humans into an assembly that calls both national parliament and government for instigation of a new laws for public space. So we we'll give you like a little uh, insight of what it is. <laughs> In Villa Lithuania, a project for Lithuanian Pavilion at Venice Biennale in 2007, we collaborated with pigeons and pigeon fanciers to intervene into the unresolved historic and political narrative between Lithuania, Russia and Italy. Combining a poetic power of performance and pigeon race, sport, we constructed a pavilion in flight that brought to public attention a story of the last occupied territory of the country. This Pigeon Pavilion won as a biennial award along with frictions and troubles with the humans at the Lithuanian government. Inspired by Georgi Kepesh and Kevin Lynch collaboration on River and City, we started River Runs, a research and design project that looks into the pedagogy of riparian cultures. As such, this project probes vision of river as public space, insisting on a renewed sense of connectedness, a reorientation within what Kepesh was calling new higher gestalt, a dynamic assemblage of human and environment. 
informed by the hydrophobic condition of the aquatic plant researcher at Oxford University in England, the device called Jellyfish Lily is designed as a membrane between human and more than human bodies and becomes a center for that symposium that brings scholars from across fields in humanities and biology. Needless to say, it invites to discover alternative movement of the human body and its expanded sensorium in, in and with the water. It should look like a Like it's swallowing me. <laughs> it's really nice. It's yeah, like being in a hammock. Like a squeak. <laughs> Do you ever have those dreams where you're being swallowed by like a, a hole in the ground? <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. Thank you. In Utopia project. We engage local sheep and archipelagic thinking to develop a project where sheep milk cheese becomes a medium that traces the well-being between the human body, body of animal, and body of the landscape. Charting traces of environmental disasters in the Baltic Sea, from the burial sites of chemical weapons to the spills of agricultural waste, this project proposed a series of cheese-making workshops that appropriated Cold War bunkers as cheese ripening facilities and invited Finnish military and their families for hand milking of sheep that repairs human soul, soil and the landscape. In 2013, together with other artist-run organizations across the ecological frontier in Europe, we developed a series of discursive events that explore the human, non-human, and poetic knowledge spheres, situating art artistic imagination in this context. Titled Zoetics, the series focused on sympoiesis, or making with and coming together in a multi-species world. To expand the discourse into material experimentation, uh, we built a lab that probed hybrid materiality inspired by sympoietic powers of mycelium. Here, the psychotropic house, Zoetics Pavilion of Ballardian Technologies, explores mycelium abilities to create new connections, mutualisms, and new materialities. For example, in Sao Paulo, by collaborating with local mycologists, we engaged an autochthonous mycelium of Pleurotus ostriatus, kind of local strain, uh, to recycle the agricultural waste from coffee sugarcane and corn plantations of Sao Paulo area established by settler colonialism. The lab nested in the center of the Biennale Pavilion engaged visitors in pedagogical experiences to understand how the mycelium colonizes substrates uh, to create new materiality for imagination of landscape and things surrounding us. Our interest in mushroom power brought us to Folkestone, a port town in English Channel, where three human agencies, Municipal Council, Kent County, and South East England region end up in a dysfunctional dispute over the responsibility for fixing street light in the main square. Our proposal was to give all power to the mushrooms. Working with scientists at the University of Kent, we developed a battery that uses carbonized mushroom as a replacement for graphite or graphene, typically used in lithium-ion batteries. 
resulting mushroom power plant powers the lamp that was taking off the city grid with the help of microbial and mushroom tissue-based batteries housed in the large manufactured rock, itself a reference to the fossil-rich cliffs in Folkestone. The power plant is not just a stone. It is all the relations that are facilitated by mushroom thinking, connecting people at the town hall, scientists working at the bio, uh, on the bio batteries, and all those who are nourishing the discourse of energy humanities. During the last four years, we've been fascinated with the swamp as a concept, a metaphor, and as a biotope that offers us a multifaceted lens through which we can look into connections and interdependencies between the life forms and non-living matter where we can discover the complexity of our symbiotic planet, as insightfully described by the biologist Lynn Margulis. Swamp has a history of imagination that represents the place outside the space of culture and civilization. Swamp Intelligence, a collaboration with AI scientist Jonas Kubilis, is based on an AI algorithm that uses white noise to generate hybrids of natural, architectural, and technological imagery and can it to human perception. The project engages the metabolism of the ecosystem where muddy and machinic organically merge with digital life forms. Nested inside a museum wall, the hybrid ecosystem probes the interdependencies of the swamp and the machine learning and renders a thought forms on the architecture that emerges from the sympoetic dreams and modernist nightmares about the swamp. Uh, and finally, the exploratory swamp game, Eat Me, was developed with the members of MIT Climate Visions and it is inviting users to experience the sympoetic relations unfolding in the trembling swamp. Swamp is a perfect milieu to sense fragile interdependencies between the organisms and their habitat. Here, every member of the community is part of every other member's environment, as well as necessary for survival of the whole. The game probes the change of perspective and allows us to embody different species by touching swampy creatures like plants, insects, birds, amphibians, fungi, bacteria or algae and discover the main rule of cannibal metaphysics. To become the other, you have to be eaten. The game experiments with the biotope model of Augstumala Pietbock, where German botanist Karl Albert Weber, at the end of the 19th century, conducted the world's first scientific study on wetlands. The creatures dwelling in the game are inspired by Weber's drawings, as well as informed by the scientific data that is collected by the biologist, including Vesta Aleknovichut, a scientist here at the Botanical Garden uh, in Konas. The Swamp Game transcends the Darwinian logic of survival of the fittest and offers the user a chance to embody different species and thus change variety of perspectives. Reflecting on the Swamp as an ecotone, the game engages with transitional nature of deep listening, chameleonic colors, aberrations of three-dimensional space, disoriented pace of movement, and chimeric language of the glyphs. The messy and irritant swamp gives us an opportunity to test the idea of symbiosis, collectively forming and becoming together, in order to find the new ethos for coexistence, a way that recognizes the poetical and political power of the ecologists all around us. Yeah, thank you. So with this provocation, we would like to invite uh, you all, uh, and uh, I hope, Marilyn, you are still with us, uh, and also the audience, uh, but first of all, uh, Renata, Jurga, and you, Marilyn, uh, to unfold the concept of uh, uh, 
uh, being together, uh, what we call social biotop, uh, as a way to engage future citizenship, uh, especially when it comes to uh, urban development or when it comes to city life, and you know, of course, we can extend it to rural uh, existence. Uh, uh, where pedagogical interventions and also process of uh, collective co-creation uh, could catalyze uh, our imagination for new commonalities, new sensitivities, and new relationships uh, with living and non-living matter around, uh, around us. Maybe we can start from comments of Professor Sheldrick, <laughs> or if Thank you for the um, but for that wonderful collection of um, of pieces, it was, it was wonderful to see them all together and and, and see the way that they um, relate to each other as a as a body of work and also um, their playfulness, the ways that they explore um, what it is to be in relation with non-human organisms and and. After all, how are we able to explore relationships if not through play, through um, trying one thing, trying another, um, enjoying the outcome, um, the unpredictability of the outcome? And, um, you know, after all, in our own lives, our human lives, if you think about, say, um, siblings in a family, think about how much the siblings play with each other. Think about um, a litter of dogs, of puppies. Think about the way they play with each other. In animal life, play is so important. So I appreciate it the playfulness of these pieces as a way to come closer to uh, forming relationships um, and, and approaching in new ways our relationships with organisms that we've had relationships with for a very long time. For example, the dogs, humans have done, done dogs have been relating together for extremely long time, but um, I enjoyed uh, that particular piece in, in, um, in turning, the, um, turning the table slightly so that we could um, approach this familiar relationship from a new point of view. So this I found all very, um, very helpful. And I think art um, and sensory experiential art pieces have a lot, uh, a big role to play in, in, in our um, stepping into new worldviews, which emphasize relationality, which, which emphasize coexistence, um, because it's in these pieces that we can really um, explore and um, we can explore in ways which might not be goal oriented or goal directed, not to achieve something in particular, but just to to expand and to deepen in our senses and in the ways that we um, encounter uh, both ourselves and, and other lives, whether human or non-human. So thank you. I appreciated that a lot. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you for those, a lot of inspirations, what you just uh, showed to us and I have several maybe even not directly related to what I, we are speaking here because uh, first of all it's so many uh, ideas how to communicate and in 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 white people to think about environment and how we can reach different goals with this uh, protest example and then with this swarm thing to show how uh, all we are really related and even I would say we depend from a human perspective on environment and this is to show and, and to speak about this coexistence and especially from the humans we really need to think how to coexist because actually we are threatening our existence in general with all the challenges what we have so this coexistence and 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 things related to environment really arises a lot of questions and also what you ended with this uh, uh, urban future development, it's actually a very, very important thing what is happening and we have to think about this coexistence and how maybe to coexist better with environment, what we have and how to, how to say, uh, use it but not to consume it. Uh, so it's, uh, and with all these, what is already happening, it may be not so deep, but of course the, the, the ground for these coexistence and co-creation with these urban gardens, with those nature-based solutions, with green roofs and, and so on and so on. So this is also the area, maybe from a more practical thing, but also to think how we can, how to say, move on 
to, and to continue being part of their planet <laughs> because nature do not need us as we need nature. So this is also raises a lot of questions and this being together yes, and, and having what is around in mind, it's also what I would, how to say, to respond to what we just saw and from the presentation of a professor also we have heard. So just a lot of, a lot of ideas at this moment. Uga, maybe you also want to add something? <laughs> yes, but um, I'm not prepared, but you know, I we are all not prepared, but uh, looking at all this, I was thinking first of all about human body and uh, how this human body is in uh, such discourses or in many other discourses, uh, maybe forgotten, but not in your art. I, I don't mean your art, but but talking about uh, fungi, bacteria, and, and so on, so on. So it is uh everything all these things are us yes but uh, if we have this uh, strict you know uh, uh, difference as we imagine between our thinking and uh, our bodily existence then we can't understand simply we can't can't perceive that these things are us and uh, uh, how to change, I, I have, I don't know, question for you all, how to change this uh, relation to our own body, bodies and uh, uh, how to skip such, uh, I don't know, um, ideal normative or just abstract uh, view to, to human body uh, because I think that without this we n we will never reach understanding of any other matter of uh, any other substance and uh, i don't know maybe i'm wrong what do you think about it yeah um actually it resonates um uh your provocation resonates with the with the previous discussion um, uh, with the question that you asked uh, Marilyn about non-human communication and non-human rationality and now it seems uh, uh, after our intervention Marilyn responded you know with his take on playfulness uh, and uh, and if I made a right uh, remark on uh, disinterested play maybe this is my interpretation but uh, but this this notion uh, Richard Sennett is using uh, in his writing, you know, disinterested play. Uh, um, and um, so I'm really interested in this kind of like tension and friction between the rationality, you know, uh, uh, you know, as especially um, if, if we're looking uh, perhaps, you know, since the Enlightenment, you know, when we're trying to rationalize all the knowledge, when we're trying to create these taxonomies that are rational, when we're trying to rationalize our collections, right? Uh, when we're trying to rationalize the boundaries. Uh, um, uh, there is a very clear friction that we're experiencing, you know, with the play. Uh, and uh, there is a very clear friction uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the idea between, or between these two concepts, rational and disinterested. Because rationality leads to the certain interest, right? And um, and I think one of the one of the major uh, perhaps crises we're experiencing because uh, we put so much emphasis on the interest of the human. You know, we're not seeing. You know, even like as we're sitting in this garden. You know, and today uh, earlier uh, we had a wonderful tour through the garden, um, and we are looking at different plants, including the bio remediators. Uh, you know, but. Uh, there is, uh, uh, but this garden, uh, let's admit, is created from very much from the human perspective, right? From the from the human interest, right? Uh, what would be the pollinator's garden? What would be the garden that is created from the pollinator's perspective? You know, what would what would be the garden that is created, you know, from the perspective of uh, not only insects but let's say bacteria? You know. Uh, um, uh, so um, so this kind of like idea of uh, our perhaps inability to engage with this disinterested play, you know, uh, 
when it comes to whether, whether we're talking about planning, but also whether we, uh, it comes, you know, when we're engaging other species, you know, and uh, especially when we bring the idea of companion species, you know, like not sort of like seeing these species as separated, but seeing them as part of, uh, well, basically in seeing environment as extension of our body, right? Uh, or maybe even reversing, maybe we are kind of like extension of someone else's body, right? You know, as, um, and uh, we had this kind of like internal joke, you know, that when we started to work with, uh, with mushrooms, uh, with fungi, with mycelium, you know, we came with this kind of like hypothesis, you know, that, uh, that we are just a substrate, you know, for the, for the, for the fungi, you know, uh, and uh, so we're not kind of like a host, you know, like we're not like sort of like the main, you know, but, but we are, yeah, we are substrate and, and perhaps, you know, some of our, um, some of our fantasies, you know, of uh, uh, traveling to other planets, for example, colonizing Mars, you know, it could be also big mushroom plot, you know, like, so mushrooms need humans, you know, mushrooms need, like, let's say, Elon Musk to make the technology so they can travel to Mars, you know, it's not like Elon Musk just thinks that it's, it's their idea, you know. So, so I think, um, I think this kind of like, uh, um, playful insertion kind of like of this interested perspective, you know, uh, that, uh, creates some kind of like, uh, friction with, uh, human autonomy. I think this is, uh, this, you know, important, uh, step, you know, towards perhaps change of perspective. I don't know, Marilyn, what, what thoughts you, you had about uh, humans being uh, sort of like big mushroom plot? I enjoy this, um, I enjoy this idea. I, I joke about it with friends um, all, all the time. And um, <clears throat> I think it's important to turn the tables to think about relationships as two-way streets. There is a relationship, is, is not a one-way process, otherwise it wouldn't be a relationship. It's, it involves both partners relating to each other and um, I enjoy flipping this perspective when it comes to relationships like humans and dogs or humans and plants, plant crops that we depend on. Um, so I also have fun flipping it when it comes to the, um, it comes to the fungi. I'm not sure whether it's um, exactly the case or not but it's so, certainly true that these fungi are benefiting from um, a human interest in them um, that there's a new story of domestication underway with some types of fungi. Um, um, for example, psilocybin producing mushrooms. Um, a handful of um, tropical strains of mushroom are now finding homes in all sorts of temperate climates around the world, which would otherwise be inhospitable. Um, they're growing in warehouses, on people's windowsills, um, under people's beds. And, um, and so there are lots of ways that that I think it helps to think from the perspective of the fungus as well as from the perspective of the human. And um, not that we need to resolve it one way or the other, but just to have that awareness of a two-way flow that, that, that we notice the, um, the, the fungi. And the fungi um, are in some way responding to us at the same time. Just some comments, what you said about this, uh, maybe uh, we are like, not as I am, but the whole community inside me is a community together, but th this rational science also speaks about that, that uh, even our mood depends on what kind of bacteria and other stuff we have inside. So this is also now some me med me medical sciences also speaks about that, that it's very much about how well we feel, uh, the mood, it also depends on our inner community, how to call it. And so it, it also comes uh, this, um, how to say, a little bit wider look at the human body as such because uh, it's not only us uh, as individual what how we understand it a person but also what it's inside what and also what is in the environment because also environment influences us the other world yes the relationship how we look at it also the pollution also might influence how we perceive ourselves, yes, and these all things are related. And, and now these happiness environment issues are really going on, especially when we speak about happiness, about uh, how much is enough. 
the, why we speak about happiness when we had everything. So we should be happy. Yeah? So it's capitalistic point of view. Uh, we are seeking this individual happiness, kind of, and, and so on. But still, we are not happy. So now these all things are, yeah, how to say, changing a little bit the view, the discussions. That's why we are here, I think, to speak about happiness. Still, it's a very important thing. Mm -hmm. And to think, uh, to find those different um, interrelationships with the environment, whatever it would be. Because uh, uh, being, how to say, really, let's say, wealthier countries and so on, we still somehow have people with, which are unhappy. And this is, um, goes sometimes far away from health, from their income and, 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 and peace even. Yeah? So, so all these things are being, even re being rationalized somehow because we still are seeking for those answers, even from those scientific, really scientific fields. So, so just wanted to... to to, to add a little bit that it's it's happening. It's not so easy maybe, but even with all these environmental things and how they contribute to the happiness. And, and, and also, as I said, for the, the uh, doctors from medical science, we also speak how our community in the um, tract also influences us. So we for sure are influenced, but maybe we do not, how to say, understand or or does he perceive this as such thing happening? Mm, then I would say the short comment uh, that yes, I agree absolutely that this term, which I was asking about a uh, little bit earlier, uh, talking with Professor Sheldrake about rationality. So this term rationality, as Professor suggested, uh, has to be uh, uh, just uh, uh, used not not I, I don't know it is it is not not very good good concept because it's like uh, polluted by philosophy let's say and uh, we should use the concept of intelligence I agree absolutely and this concept of intelligence I think it includes and what Renata just said uh, I mean all uh, processes in brain and and this uh, concept of intelligence embraces all intelligence of our bodies and uh, including uh, where to leave a place for s something else for some other forms of life and uh, where to stop com consuming uh, what we don't need this is this everything could be called intelligence, the same intelligence. So if we could replace the uh, term rationality more with the term intelligence, then we can say, if I'm right, uh, uh, we can talk about intelligence of plants, about intelligence of uh, fungi, about intelligence of uh, dogs. Uh, yeah, we do that constantly. But uh, about intelligence of fishes too. So, uh, or... W wouldn't it be a solution or maybe, I don't know, uh, um, first step to solution? Um, yeah, well, uh, we, we, we are very much interested in this, uh, in, the, in the idea of intelligence. Uh, um, and we've been pondering uh, on it in the few of our projects. Um, we came to this uh, uh, quest on intelligence uh, partially because uh, we were irritated by seeing uh, artificial intelligence project, you know, unfolding, uh, you know, mainly from, uh, you know, by the scientists uh, and also mathematical modeling, you know, being very much sort of like uh, built on this uh, um, second uh, cybernetic sort of like, uh, I, you know, idea kind of like that emerges uh, f perhaps from uh, Norbert Wiener, uh, Second World War, kind of like, uh, and, uh, um, and then uh, sort of like grows into mathematical modeling and the idea that everything can be put into computer, everything is computable. So, uh, while certainly we are, are and, it, you know, and I hope that there is more people who are realizing that not everything is computable, 
uh, and there are other forms of intelligence that uh, do not uh, lend themselves uh, to computation. Um, and, uh, and that's how we came to kind of like formulate the idea of artistic intelligence, you know. And we have some Alice in some other design disciplines, you know, like who are also calling for design intelligence, you know. And now we are talking about uh, mycelium intelligence or mushroom intelligence, you know. And now we are recognizing also intelligence of other species, you know, intelligence of slime mold, intelligence uh, um, uh, of uh, birds, uh, you know. And, uh, and this kind of like some of this intelligence cannot even be explained by the rationality of the science, like, you know, the how homing pigeons finding their root. Science cannot fully explain. You know, they can explain about 80%, you know, but... Uh, Even more. Ma yeah, but still, there is some kind of like, you know, some part of the mystery, you know. Um, and, um, and going further, kind of like with this question, uh, for me, um, it is interesting what also you touched in, 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 in this, in the first uh, part of this uh, meeting, uh, um, which was non-human communication, right? So how intelligence uh, and you know uh, can be communicated, can be can be transferred, you know, can be perhaps uh, engaged, um, uh, learned. Uh, uh, could we use uh, language in this sense, you know, given that it is such a human construct? Uh, and of course, you know, arguably you could say, well, look at birds, you know, look at whales, and look at, you know, like even, um, you know, there are artists who recorded sounds of the mating shrimp, for example, you know, like so, so we have all these like creatures uh, who are, uh, you know, who have not only language, but they have even like forms of singing, right, as we know from whales, for example. Uh, but, uh, but for me, it is really interesting how this, you know, uh, intelligence, like, for example, if we're speaking about uh, less obvious forms of life that have maybe, uh, or less research forms of life, you know, like going from mushrooms to lichens that were mentioned today, um, and, uh, yeah, and how they're communicating, what, uh, uh, and how can also we um, uh, learn about that communication? Right? You know, uh, do we need some mediators? You know, uh, uh, can we sort of like talk directly to the plant, or we would need uh, some kind of like uh, mediators? You know, and again, I wonder how much this is human construct. Like, do we need technology to mediate that, or uh, or we need, uh, or maybe, or maybe we should look at some cultures that were for a long time disregarded and not considered as human and perhaps pushed uh, and withdrawn uh, from the taxonomy of the human knowledge. And, uh, and only recently we started to look at indigenous epistemologies, indigenous knowledges, as they, uh, as they managed to preserve ways uh, to communicate with plants, to communicate with the environment, and perhaps build some kind of like uh, language, if we can call it language. I wonder, what do you think? Yeah, Marilyn, I wonder, what do you think? Well, I certainly think that this <clears throat> question of communication is, is a really important one. And there's more and more work going on, actually, in, in terms of um, communication, in terms of un interpreting under, under, or other organisms' language. Um, there have been some interesting studies using pattern recognition, um, machine learning algorithms to um, to analyze whale song, for example, and to do pattern recognition on whale song and to try and come up with some uh, like meaningful units of whale communication. Um, and this may be a fruitful way forward. Um, it's hard to say. I, I, I personally am not in a position to say um, yet um, how, how I think this will unfold. But um, the idea of communication as being more than just language with sound, I think is very important too. Visual communication, the way that a flower communicates to a bee, for example, the way that uh, chemical communication, which is a very important subject, um, the way that microbes in the soil communicate to each other, the way that a plant communicates with the organisms, the microorganisms in the soil um, on which it depends. Um, all of these different, these different media um, 
these different media for communication and, and uh, expression, um, the more we think about the diversity of, of language and the diversity of communication, I think the more we will come into a, um, a polyphonic world of many um, simultaneous channels of interaction and communication, and the more interesting life will be for us, I, I believe. Um, so I'm excited to see these developments and excited to see these, um, these new types of exploration as to um, uh, what is communication and also what, what is language and how can we deepen and expand our concept of, of language. Want to add that we have here also in, in our university some some scientists that speak about how plants communicate with each other. So it's really ongoing and, and, and interesting things how we do that with these chemical signals and and, and different um, chemical substances that they produce and so on and so on. So the, the, this is happening. This is the problem that we only want everything understand as we understand. Yeah? So this is maybe the big question how, yeah, maybe even we, we do not need to understand everything. Sometimes I think that it's good that some secrets, secrets are left because when we have some secrets, when we want to somehow preserve more what we have because we still do not know what we have. When the time comes when we know everything, so maybe we will decide not to preserve it. <laughs> so sometimes I, I think that it's good, that something is still unknown and we still have happiness while researching and trying to answer those questions because so many things are really happening on this, how would I say, small, small level, on the tissue level on, and, 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 and so on. So. Uh, yeah, the main thing that I wanted here to stress that uh, well, this is that we want again to put everything as we understand that it should be. Yes, but it's happening, and and science also tries to, as as Professor mentioned, to answer those questions. Yeah, but I'm not sure if you would really want to hear what they speak about us. <laughs> Oh, I agree absolutely and uh, I think that this question about mediators I, I, I cannot stop thinking about it that mediators we need only if we think from the uh, perspective of uh, this hierarchical structure where a human being is on the top and tries to understand everything and everyone and uh, and communicate with the every living being in the world so uh, do we have to do this do we have to do this do we have to know all the plants in the world uh, because we, we, we never will <laughs> and it is it is absolutely impossible and uh, do we have to to uh, understand somehow uh, I don't know technically uh, yes it is it is very interesting I, I can understand this but um, communication is not not that communication is not absolute understanding communication is like uh, being humble a little bit and uh, being uh, on the level of this uh, plant uh, which you try to understand as i think i don't know i don't know but uh, maybe maybe there is some interest and i'm i'm not speaking about scientific interest but about the common belief that we can understand every living being in the world and uh, that we know what it needs or uh, just what it thinks or what it uh, likes or or fears or and, and, and so on so but uh, yeah i like your idea of also like maybe not uh, knowing everything really makes us more happier yeah i can imagine if we would know everything we might be like very uh, troubled <laughs> but uh, on the other hand uh, i wanted to ask you as philosophers or also as uh, those who really deal with science what is the role of biology in that because i 
us as artists and myself, I really noticed this some kind of bio, bio, biological turn, you could say, lately, but suddenly, you know, uh, yeah, like getting to know things from the biological point of view gives many, many answers which we didn't know. And this, in a way, leads us to the moment of changing the perspective. So, you know, how to balance and how, in order to change that perspective and in order to change our attitude, which we all agree what we have to do, because, you know, otherwise might be like, we will not survive at all as a species even, yeah? So how to balance that? How to, how to balance this, like a wish of not knowing, but at the same time, like being so open, so we would be, you know, able to accept the idea that we will die and we will become you know, the mushroom or we will become a bacteria and just like take it with the joy in a way, you know, not being afraid of that, not being like, mm, yeah, not, not, not thinking what we have to live forever, but we have to just change and transform. So what is the, how do you see this role of biology in that moment as a science? I'm not a biologist by my background, so, but maybe Professor will add later on more that he's a biologist. <laughs> but uh, it's every time about the, the balance everywhere and, and in science and ethics also, in, in science ethics, and how far we can go with uh, technologies, I would say, yeah, because we very much rely on technologies, but those technologies not every time uh, are good ones, I would say, like this, and this is, uh, again, we come back to the, I know, values what we have, yes, uh, what we consider what is good or bad, uh, moral things, ethics again, and it's about, again, about culture, how we understand, yes, how we look at the others also, so this is, if we speak in terms of environment, so it's, is it everything, every time humans and anthropocentric point of view, bold view, or it's that ecocentric view that we see as part of environment ourselves. So this is uh, ethical questions that, of course, it's, it's, it would be nice to have one right answer, but I think there is so many answers behind. So, yeah, so maybe the professor would add <laughs> more from biology side. I think I just feel like it's important to behave as if all of the organisms around us, human or non-human, um, have a perspective. And, um, and if we do that, then the world becomes a, a much more interesting and fascinating place. And I feel like maybe a lot of um, human, modern human thought, um, the bodies of philosophy and bodies of uh, theory, have evolved without taking on board the idea that other organisms, uh, whether other types of other humans, other human cultures or other human beings, uh, or other organisms have a perspective. Um, so the biological turn for me is, is a step towards this, it's a step towards um, acknowledging that other organisms have a perspective and that we might have something to learn from them and learn from exploring those relationships as relationships, as two-way streets. Yeah, I uh, I had uh, another another question that was perhaps also um, um, introduced earlier uh, the idea uh, the idea of the other senses and the idea of the sensorial body versus the visual. Um, um, so um, I'm interested in this uh, moment in history. I think it was. Uh, uh, was it like uh, 69 or 72 when Apollo 11 mission brought back to Earth uh, this uh, first selfie of the Earth, the blue marble, the image of the blue marble, right? Uh, and I think uh, 
uh, NASA at the time and American government, they were debating uh, whether they should, uh, they should actually uh, bring this image to humanity, whether, you know, what could be the consequences, like, you know, like, should, should, should they share this image or should they classify and kind of like and leave it, you know. So, uh, what apparently happened, you know, that this image became the most known image, uh, you know, across countries and cultures, the most known image, the most reproducible image by humanity. Uh, what in turn this image gave, you know, as a false, uh, false assumption to humans that uh, planet uh, can be understood and managed completely. You know, this was kind of like, you know, again, kind of like folded into cybernetic discourse, kind of like management of the planet, you know. Um, and, uh, uh, and of course, now, uh, now we have uh, entirely new concepts, you know, like, so, for example, Bruno Latour, uh, with his landing on Earth, he introduces the uh, idea of the critical zone, you know, uh, so it's no longer the image of the planet Earth, right? But, uh, but it is this like very thin layer where life is possible, right? Um, and um, um, so along Latour and, um, and others uh, and other theories, uh, there is this uh, attempt to look uh, beyond the visual, beyond, uh, you know, beyond what it can be captured uh, with cameras or even with scientific tools, right? Like, you know, so... Uh, uh, looking into the invisible or even like understanding uh, the environment, understanding the world, understanding the nature uh, with other faculties, you know, we can call with other senses, right? Uh, so um, I really, mm, I, I would be very much interested in sort of like, um, yeah, in, in, in your comments, you know, uh, uh, Marilyn, what, what do you think of kind of like of this uh, uh, of using other senses in terms of knowing the environment, uh, A, and also in terms of this kind of like uh, privileging the visual uh, almost as a as a central entry into the into the unknowable. It's a big subject, and and the ways that we privilege, um, the way that modern scientific cultures privilege visual senses um, is, is well discussed, you know, and, and, and in so many ways, in, in the metaphors we use when you say, I see, to mean I understand, for example, um, it has uh, worked its way so deeply into our structures of thought, um, certainly in, um, in, in the, the places I grew up uh, and I was educated. And, um, so, yeah, so we, 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 we are very biased towards our visual senses. And, and that's why I like thinking about underground life, life that happens in the soil, because there's no horizon in the soil. Um, almost all organisms in the soil do not use light. Light is not a helpful cue um, for those organisms in the soil. And so when we try to understand the lives of soil organisms, it's an extra leap for us imaginatively, because um, because it's difficult for us to imagine a life without the visual. Um, so, for example, I was just in Patagonia on a field trip um, with some organizations I work with, and we were sampling soils to, to analyze the fungal communities there. And my brother was there. He's a, he's a sound ecologist um, and a musician, and he'd brought microphones, which he was burying in the soil. And then we put on these headphones and listened to this incredible noise going on underground, all, all sorts of strange sounds, um, a sort of bubbling, you know, squelching, a bit like the sound of digestion, the sound of a stomach turning over. And, um, and we didn't know who was making all the noises. You know, it was a black box. It was just a lot of noise. But what was it, it was helpful for? Because we could see, we could hear how busy the underground was um, and, and begin to think about how important sound might be for these organisms who live in the soil. Because um, it's very important to... Um, I guess it's a bit like the ocean. Sound is well conducted through um, through wet media, and um, and if you don't have sight or light to depend on, then then sound is a, is, is a useful um, sense to work with. So this is just one way that I recently uh, enjoyed um, stepping outside the visual and into a, another type of sense to try and imagine the, the lives of these soil organisms more on their own terms. Um, I think there are many ways we can do this. Uh, and I think it's a really important exercise 
um, to, to take part in. But another point relating to your other senses, there's other senses like other sight, hearing, taste, etc. Um, but there's also just the, the, the sense, the, the mixture of all of this that comes with the phenomenal um, sensorial capability of being a subjective person, of being a subject, um, understanding emotionally, understanding kinesthetically, understanding intellectually, and when those all things, they, they all come together. And um, so I think there's something to be gained from admitting that we are perceiving subjects, that we have feelings, um, and the ways that we notice and observe involve those feelings um, and those um, the mixture of all of those cues uh, and perceptions in a way that we don't necessarily know how to separate into different senses. Um, and um, you know, that's there whether we like it or not, and, and it's, it's often very easy to, to, to forget that or to, to ignore it, but I think that's uh, maybe relates to your question of, of, of feeling, of, of knowing um, with other senses that might not be um, perceivable to scientific instruments. I would agree here. I just wanted to add, and you also mentioned about these uh, uh, indigenous uh, people who have some relationship and know and understand better and feel better in the environment, see the signs and th see that communication, what nature wants to share. Yeah? So it doesn't necessarily has to fall under some scientific class or whatever, some ranking or t t uh, terms or whatever. So I think this is uh, what to feel this sense. Uh, of course, it's in, in important from a scientific point to have even the sounds or uh, some other data and the research just to, to sometimes even to prove for the people that there is something in that soil, yes, and that the soil is really very important. We, because of soil, we have the plants, because of soil, we have what to eat and so on and so on. So sometimes it's also very important, but you also have to think about this not materialistic, maybe mm, benefits what we get, but also this sense uh, of different things, uh, sense of place, uh, traditions, what we also uh, embedded them in the nature what, where we live. Yeah? So if we have oaks here in Lithuania, so we are Lithuanians kind of feel, feel proud of that. Yeah? Some other countries have their own traditional plants and so on and 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 this mushroom thing uh, what we have here also yes it's, it's it's kind of defining us also yeah so this being um, all these sense are important and in maybe not only in scientific uh, how to say area but in in in, in this cultural traditions um, uh, also even identifying as a person in some of some community also plays a role and, and, and I think that what just Professor mentioned that sometimes we have the, the whole um, bunch of senses and we do not even separate that something is more important than we just feel something because the same in the, in the forest. So you see, you smell, you can touch. Yeah, so everything comes together and it's, it can be kind of separated and then you feel, okay, I'm at home. <laughs> Excellent. I just wanted to say that I'm, um, I'm going to have to leave um, in a moment. I just wanted to say thank you for this conversation and thank you for, for having me here. And it's been a, a real pleasure to participate and uh, I wish you all the best in, in, in your inquiries and, and, and further discussions. Thank you, Melvin. That was, that was really fantastic uh, having you and uh, having your book on the table and also having this conversation engaging you with, uh, with, a lot of, uh, with a lot of questions, uh, uh, some of them directly uh, dealing with the idea of co-happiness and uh, others maybe laterally, but kind of like supporting the thinking of, of how can we engage with, uh, yeah, with uh, uh, elusive and wicked uh, problems and questions. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Be well. Thank you. And thank you, Renata and Jurga yes. and Nomeda. Thank you.